days. Please accept our apologies. Uh, a complete set of documents with respect to this meeting is available. If anybody doesn't have them and wishes them, uh, let me see whether they should talk to Mr. Einer and Ms. Two for who should they talk to, Mr. Van Art. One of the one of the two of them, with respect to materials. Uh, we're working on it, and we are. Uh, doing the best we can to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Apparently, we're very popular. A lot of people like to go to our website, which is a good thing. Uh, secondly, we're going to move a couple things around on the agenda without objection. We're going to take uh, item number four, and before item number four, we're going to take item number seven, the business plan update, and then we'll go to item number four. I, and as Vice Chair Shank reminds me, we need to do the Pledge of Allegiance as well. So, uh, if we'll stand, I'll ask Commissioner Richards to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll also, to make sure that uh, we have a quorum recorded, ask uh, Madam Secretary if you would uh, call those present so we can establish a quorum. Chairman Umberg? Here. Mr. Richards? Here. Ms. Schenck? Here. Mr. Burns? Mr. Toledo? Mr. Balgonorth? Mr. Hartnett? Here. Mr. Richard? Here. Mr. Rossi? Here. Thank you. We have uh, a great deal of interest this morning and a great number of those in the audience who wish to uh, engage in public comment. In order to make sure that, that everybody gets a chance, we're going to start with 90 seconds of public comment uh, and then see per person, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll do 90 seconds. Everyone stand up at the same time and go. Uh, we're doing 90 seconds uh, per person. Per comment, we'll start with, with item number one, comment on item number one, and work our way through uh, all the public comment. I should add, though, if, if it looks as though we're, we're not going to get to everyone, I, I, I may actually change the, the, the time period as well. So uh, let's start with um, first Mr. Lauder, followed by Cheryl, I, I can't quite read the last name, maybe Bear, uh, followed by Paul uh, Guerrero. Mr. Lauder. Is Mr. Lauder here? Okay. I was just in the process of uh, writing my speech when you called my name. I <laughs> apologize. Uh, I had written an article uh, some months ago I called Bipolar Express. And uh, I, I'm going <clears> to <throat> just read a couple of sections from it, and uh, I have noticed that uh, the rail authority has a difficult time justifying cost, and uh, in defending itself, a lot of times the recourse has been to indulge in the indefinence of sentiment as a means of persuasion. The strategy is to use trite, shallow, shallow sound bites such as progress is the future and for the greater, greater good in lieu of substance. Such authoritative sounding but insupportable certitudes are meant to quiet skeptical inquiry. The implication being that anyone in opposition must be whining naysayers to progress and all that is good, noble, and patriotic. But you say it is the future, but no one knows what the future will look like any more than anyone could have predicted some 30 years ago the full and continuing impact of the Internet. That innovation was one which grew out of a culture that was poised and ready to accept it. It is an example of progress that arose organically within, from within, not one that was artificially opposed, imposed from without. We now find ourselves in an age where the mass movement of information, not people, seems the more realistic predictor of things to come. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lauder. Uh, 
I mentioned this before, but if a speaker expresses your point of view and you wish to simply adopt that point of view uh, and, and you come up and you say, you know, I, I agree with Mr. X or Ms. Y, that's perfectly acceptable. And also, uh, we read the written comments that you send us. Uh, we, we get a great number of comments and, and we read them. So if you wish to uh, express your point of view in writing, uh, if you'd like to do so in a, in a uh, mode that would take more than 90 seconds, for example, this meeting, please do so. All right. Uh, Ms. Cheryl, and, and I can't quite read the last name. It's um, Bray. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. Bray, B-R-A-Y. Could, could you do us a favor and move those two microphones a little closer and perfect that work? And speak right? That's perfect. Can yes. you hear me? We can hear you much better now. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, my name is Cheryl Bray, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I have followed the newspapers in the last few days, but I will say I'm a little confused because I remember a few years ago that the I remember hearing it was going to be 30 Eight billion, but the paper in 2009, I believe it was, showed 43 billion, and now it's changed to 98.5 billion. There wasn't enough room for all the zeros, so I just wanted to clarify that that in fact is the case, and that's in 2011, and of course there's more time to come. I also have yesterday's paper that quoted the. Um, Airfare from San Francisco to L.A. in 2009 being $95. The cost of the airfare today is $59. So there's certainly more incentive to fly than there would be to take a train. In addition, and that is from Southwest Airlines, um, in addition it says the federal government announced some $3.6 billion in funding for the project, which only leaves $94.9 billion in funding. That $94.9 billion would be up to the rest of us, and certainly the invoice for that would be at least $2,000 per person, and that's a minimum, and this is not even completed yet. And I just can't envision that there would be that many people taking this high-speed rail when on the East Coast you find many of the trains are not even filled from New York City to D.C. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Guerrero, followed by uh, Ms. Diana Lacombe. Good morning. Yeah, I, too, read the same paper or a similar paper, but the article that intrigued me uh, deals with the disparity study. As uh, you're well aware, the FRA has uh, directed that the high-speed rail conduct a disparity study, and, uh, which is a preclude to race conscious goals on the project. Uh, but w what I would suggest is, according to the paper, you're not going to get to L.A. In for 20 years. So we don't need a statewide disparity study, because any study you do of L.A. will, I'm sure, will be outdated 20 years from now. So let's if we're going to do a disparity study, let's do the disparity study on the Central Valley. And you can save money, we can save time, and we can move along with the project. The uh, second thing I wanted to point out is uh, within the uh, EIR reports, you have a segment called environmental justice. And the first report that came out from Fresno South to uh, Bakersfield uh, touched on air quality and, and uh, among other things. But the second study that came out from Fresno North never mentioned air quality. And I would remind you that the Central Valley right now is, on, is waiting for its third strike and a $29 million fine. And I would suggest that it's possible that they will incur that $29 million fine the day you start running diesels up and down those tracks. Uh, uh, and I don't know how you're going to mitigate the, uh, the air quality from the diesel, but I would suggest that it shouldn't be the taxpayers of the Central Valley that pay the fine. It should be the, EI, the high speed rail. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Lacombe, followed by uh, B. Benson. Uh, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Diana Lacombe, and I'm representing APAC. And uh, first of all, I'd like to make a statement that we are seeking race conscious uh, DBE program on this project. Uh, we've reviewed the small business program, and it is excellent for small business. However, uh, when we filed a Title VI complaint with USDOT, 
on behalf of minority and women businesses, it was to stop discrimination. This plan does not directly assess, address that, so we're recommending that the program be separated into two sections, state and federal, and uh, also the 30% uh, the small business goal is excellent also, uh, but it does not really ensure that minority and women businesses participate. You could fill the whole 30% with small, non-minority uh, businesses and not include any minorities. We recommend that you implement USDOT's 29.36 Code of Federal Regulations. It talks about small business. You don't have to have uh, all, you know, the, the uh, disparity study and everything concluded at the time. You can implement the small business, which includes set-asides for, for small business. Our concern right now is that there are contracts out to bid, two right-of-way contracts, $40 million apiece, that uh, do not have any goals on it. We, rec we, we would like for you to look at those closely and also the design bills that are going to be coming up. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, B. Benson, followed by uh, Martin Maisner. Uh, Ms. Benson, before you begin, we have, as you can see, lots of folks who wish to comment. Uh, again, if there's someone who expresses your point of view, and you wish to either adopt their point of view or to uh, forego your comments, that would be fine. If you want to send us something in writing, that would also be fine. Uh, at 10.30 today, we're going to take all public comment before we begin the substantive part of our agenda. So uh, if you wish to comment on any item, let me repeat that. If you wish to comment on any item, now is the time to fill out um, a green slip and submit it. After 10.30, we won't be accepting any more green slips. So go ahead, Ms. Benson. I'm Bobby Benson. I'm from Burlingame, California, which is on the peninsula on San Francisco Bay. Um, the route that you have in mind is definitely in question. Going up the peninsula in this densely packed town's not wise. You don't have the money to, to put the tunnel underground. If you don't have the money, if it's impossible to afford, and of course it is, We'll wait until you can afford it, to afford to do it right. If you must come up the peninsula at all, we wish you'd come up the East Bay. They're going to have a negative impact on these small, densely packed towns. Uh, economically, we'll lose businesses. Our, that's our tax base. Uh, socially, uh, it's going to ruin our downtown revitalization plans in these towns. Socially, it'll widen the gap of the tracks, 120 feet, will cut out our, our trees. It'll ruin it if you're going at grade, absolutely ruin our small towns. Every single one of them will feel a devastating impact. And security-wise, densely packed areas, schools, too close to schools, too close to our local traffic, it is not a wise decision to come up the peninsula. We'll go to San Francisco, we'll go to San Jose, Please, fellas, don't come up the peninsula. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Maisner, followed by uh, Mr. Russ Cohen. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Maisner, let me make another administrative announcement. Yeah. Uh, the draft 2012 business plan is now available for everyone. Uh, a number of the questions that you may have are answered in this plan. If you look in the back, there's a section called Frequently Asked Questions. And you'll also notice that there have been some changes with respect to the, uh, the course of the high-speed rail system. I don't mean the route. I mean the course of how we're going to complete the system that may also uh, resolve some of your issues. So, sir, go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. I brought you an apple. It's kind of shiny, but when you look at it, you'll actually see that it's rotten. Uh, by the way, this is not a Central Valley apple. It comes from Washington. Our apples are good. A while back, a rail authority board member once said the analysis that showed that the system was not a $33 billion uh, cost, but rather twice that amount, was the work of a few rotten apples. And those rotten apples needed to be stopped. Nobody on the board, by the way, took him to task for making a statement like that. Uh, I think your IOS North ridership numbers are a complete fantasy. You're projecting that the Central Valley to the North segment will have 7.3 million annual riders. That region has a population base of 14 million people, including all nine Bay Area counties. 
you compare that to Amtrak's northeast region stretching from Boston to New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C., with a population of 48 million people and a total passenger capacity each year, total passenger uh, uh, total each year of 10 million passengers, how, it is even, how is it even remotely possible that the Bakersfield to Bay Area route carries almost as many riders? It's just not possible. It doesn't pass the smell test. And you're basing your, your ridership projections on the initial surveys that were done that were proven to be invalid and not reliable for policy purposes. And all the work that's been done since then has been based on those invalid numbers. I'd ask you not to get back into the rotten apple business again. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, followed by Jennifer uh, Paff. Thank you, members of the board. First, I'd like to compliment you on your lovely uh, image up there. Uh, unfortunately, as human beings, we'll never be able to see it quite from that angle uh, because we don't fly. Um, it'd be nice if you showed this project from the ground up. Uh, I've traveled here as part of a group called HighSpeedBoondoggle.com. That's www.HighSpeedBoondoggle.com. <laughs> But I'm here today to speak to you and Governor Brown as a Democrat. As a Democrat, I believe in providing good public transit options and, and a great deal of other ideals. But I've analyzed this project in a myriad of ways, and with each analysis, I conclude that I can't, as a good Democrat, condone this project. It creates jobs by sacrificing others. It builds new infrastructure while neglecting existing infrastructure and it siphons critical education funds and transfers it to a transit system that has yet to prove its necessity. So members of the board, Governor Brown, the question is, what devastating impacts will this project bring to California? But also, what impact will it have on the Democratic Party? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Path, followed by Mr. Ted Crocker. Hello, I'm Jennifer Foff. I'm from Burlingame. I agree with actually most all of the comments that have come before me, so I'm not going to repeat them, but I do think this is um, it's simply fiscally irresponsible when we have so many other needs. And I can talk about needs in our community, but there are many others that are hurting a lot more. Um, regarding the um, SEGWE, uh, the, the that's the short, the acronym for the Simidian Gordon Eshoo um, proposal or Eshoo Gordon proposal that uh, considers a two-track blended system um, until it, and if would be necessary to go to the four. Um, we're not really com comfortable with that, and I hate to see the press reports saying that we are. We don't feel any better about that, at least I don't. Um, I think that leaves open a lot of problems, continues to leave open problems that didn't address the EIR, that's never been completed, has not really addressed the ridership that's still in question. There's still, when this was brought up in the first place, and I was well aware of it, it was, a start, it was meant to be a starting point. It wasn't an end point. It was a starting point for discussion, and it hasn't been well fleshed out. And I think um, to take that now and say we're, we're okay with that, we're feeling better, I can tell you we're not feeling better at all. And uh, I, um, I hope you, you consider that um, as we go on. Um, let's see if I have anything else. I think I'm not going to waste any more time. I basically just want to make sure you know that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Crocker, followed by Jerry um, It's uh, Carlson, I believe. Set in the clock. Uh, Ted Crocker, I'm a co-founder of High Speed Boondoggle. Uh, I'm a registered and independent, and I'm not happy to be here. In what universe does it make financial sense to stick with something where the increasing costs have outstripped the increase in funding by 20 to 1? And that doesn't include the finance costs. I can only conclude it is a universe where the final dollar amount doesn't matter. A universe where returning the federal dollars doesn't matter. What matters is getting the shovels in the ground. When I voted for high-speed rail, and I did, I read the bond measure and it read like a feasibility study. The state Senate's June 2008 report on high-speed rail made it clear to the voters 
this project would not be a conventional pay-as-you-go infrastructure project. Now I'm hearing otherwise. If high-speed rail couldn't be built as promised, it wouldn't be built. The board seems to think a yes vote gave them a mandate from God to build high-speed rail no matter what. And apparently our legislators do too. It's clear to me that both the board and our legislators have lost all touch with reality. And apparently Jerry Brown is still earning his nickname. <laughs> this is not what I voted for. Thank is you, there sir. any wonder why there's a general we'll be happy unrest to, in the populace? If you'd like to submit written comments, that'd be great. All right, uh, next, um, I believe it's Carlson, followed by Mr. Jim Bigelow. Good morning, Jerry Carlson, Council Member of the Town of Atherton. I was on the stakeholder conference call yesterday. Thank you very much for making that possible. Oh, what a difference two years makes. The last business plan. Costs are now twice, over twice the amount that uh, was projected two years ago. There certainly is greater skepticism within the state legislature in terms of whether the project should go forward or not. Certainly voter sentiment has turned dramatically around as far as this project is concerned. At a town meeting, Senator Simidian talked about a poll that he, it was taken recently. Two year, back in, when Proposition 1A was passed, the, the people passed it 60% in our area versus 53% statewide. This most recent poll showed that only 50% would support it However, when the question is asked, if you don't know the cost or don't know the source of funding, would you still support it? Two-thirds would not support it. In terms of jobs, I think you should be, the analysis should be full disclosure. As the bond costs, the servicing costs for high-speed rail take a greater proportion of the state general fund budget throughout the life of the project, it means there will be fewer funds for other things. So you need to factor in the lost jobs in education, social services, regional transportation, and all the other areas. This Thank is definitely a water, watershed moment. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Mr. Bigelow, followed by uh, Councilmember Baylock. Uh, Jim Bigelow with the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber. Uh, the blended system on the peninsula has a lot more promise than four tracks from San Francisco to San Jose. Uh, and we're looking carefully at what Caltrain is going to come up with and their alternatives for what that configuration might be. And I understand the same idea may be happening in the Anaheim LA corridor. Uh, I thank you for taking into account my remarks on the uh, air capacity of airports and flight delays and so forth and how the high speed rail could assist with that in the new document still haven't had a chance to read the whole thing. I would suggest uh, the deadline for comments uh, be the middle of January because we have Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up and our minds are on other things, hopefully, than just high-speed rail, like uh, being together with family. So we will be commenting more in detail. The bar is raised as far as the financial uh, jump we have to take to deliver this project and the phasing uh, the San Francisco Peninsula and the uh, Anaheim to LA uh, many of us in the room probably won't be around to see that in the schedule that I see thank you thank you sir councilmember Baylock followed by um, Miss Thielen got to move these downward uh, Honorable Chairman Umberg, I'm Kathy Baylock. I'm a 10-year councilwoman with the City of Burlingame, two-time past mayor. And I come on behalf of our residents, many of whom, if you would identify yourselves in the audience, who have come together to um, share our concerns, continue concerns about the effects on our town. Um, essentially, our town will be split in two, no matter what system is eventually adopted. Caltrain, uh, was born in our town in 1894 and our town developed around it. It's essentially the center of our city. So the impacts will be great no matter what your decision. 
And some might say, well, why are you here? The Peninsula EIR has been suspended. We're focusing elsewhere. Um, why not let the Central Valley get built and the money will be run out and you won't have anything to worry about anymore? But if someone reminded me to do that, it's un-American. Our concern for those folks in the Central Valley, same as I have for the folks in Burlingame, California. And what I want you to think about, a $99 million, billion dollar mandate, which was a $33 billion mandate three years ago. Is this what the voters expected, that there was an open checkbook to build high-speed rail no matter what? And I care because by the time it gets to our section, there won't be funds to do it correctly and the, the long-term ramifications of being collateral damage will really damage our town for the next 100 years. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Ms. Ms. Thielen followed by Supervisor Perea. Uh, good morning. Um, many of us are perplexed as to why there is such an obsession with spending money only on this project. Most people, especially construction workers, just want to work. It doesn't have to be on high-speed rail. Instead of wasting their efforts on something that is ill-planned, why not use their efforts wisely, or use your efforts wisely, on repairing our dilapidated infrastructure or building new projects like dams that will actually return an economic benefit but also provide clean energy and low-cost food supply to the citizens of the United States. Speaking of dams, I find it particularly curious that there is a movement afoot to not only stop building or raising dams that supply the clean electricity needed to run the trains that we can't afford anyway, but to actually tear out dams such as the ones on the Klamath River. Between the Delta smelt, the attack on dams, and now the prospect of a train tearing out farming infrastructure, clouding the value of the land, and providing uncertainty for farmers, it's time for this state to crawl off the sacrificial altar to radical environmentalism and stop taking land out of production, which attacks the core of our state's already wobbly economy. Do you board members have an obligation to do what is best for the country or is your only task to build this rail system regardless of the consequences? You should ask Congress and the state to take action to allow this money to be used wisely. Mr. Mr. Perea followed by uh, Elizabeth Alexis. Thank you, Supervisor Perea. Continuing your perfect attendance record. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. <laughs> And thank you all for, again for your leadership and for putting out an excellent business plan. We believe that it's a realistic uh, projection of, uh, uh, of what the vision for California is for moving people, goods, and services around the state. And as we all know, the population is going to near double in 25 years, so we have to do something different than what we're doing today. Um, no question Fresno County being the number one ag producing county in the state of California stands in support of high-speed rail, and that, that does not waver. That support does not waver. And I'd just like to leave you with, with one analogy. And I know how tough it is, and there's concern from folks in this audience and others in the state, but I believe the majority of Californians support this project for all the right reasons. But if I could just give the analogy of the Golden Gate Bridge, $17 million uh, with the initial estimate to build it. All those that stood in opposition to the Golden Gate Bridge said it was going to cost $100 million that it was impossible to do, and we should do something else because it was tough times. It cost $34 million, so yes, it did cost more than they projected. But who would argue against the Golden Gate Bridge today? So you're visionaries. You're obviously making some very tough decisions, but you know that the majority of Californians stand behind you. Thank you. Yeah. Supervisor Perea. Ms. Alexis, followed by um, Bob Heinen. Uh, good morning. Elizabeth Alexis of California's Advocating Responsible Rail Design Card, calhsr.com. Uh, we came before you in September of 2009 and told you that your cost estimates were not accurate. We wanted accurate cost estimates, not just for the sake of having accurate cost estimates. The truth by itself is useful and nice, but it doesn't really get you very far. We wanted those numbers because we wanted to have that conversation about what system should we build. Once you have good data, then you start your project planning. And we were disappointed in the plan to see that nothing really has changed. We've changed the price tag, but nothing about the plan has really changed. So we look forward to a dialogue over the coming months, but we think we need to step back at this point and think about how do, you know, how do we get to this place? Is, should it cost that much money? Is there a different way to do this? 
And if it is going to be expensive, is there a way to change the phasing that brings benefits sooner? And right now you have the Central Valley absorbing all the impact now with benefits that are literally 20 or 30 years down the line. There has to be a better way, and, and hopefully we'll get to that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Heinen, followed by Mr. Jans. Thank you. Um, I represent some of the uh, neighbors of uh, Menlo Park on Felton, on Lenox, on Tudor. Um, I share some of the concerns here of, uh, that have been spoken already. The $33 billion first has started out is now $100 billion. Um, I believe that that will continue to escalate. Um, I just want to give you my personal um, uh, tale for you. Um, my daughter is in eighth grade. My son now is a senior in high school. I'm concerned about paying for their college education. I'm a finance officer in background. 45 days ago, I was laid off. I don't have a job now. But what I did for those two previous years at that company was to make the hard decisions and reduce their costs in an era where we have declining revenues. Um, I put their house in order. That company will stay around. It will survive. But a fortunate part of it was I got laid off once I had completed my work. I think the task is at hand to view of what's going on with this. We don't need, I don't want, high-speed rail. It's a project that is not worth the dollar spent, and I wish you considered that. Thank you. Mr. Jans, followed by Mr., uh, I believe it's Ted Hart. Uh, good morning. Uh, Jim Jans, President of the Community Coalition on High-Speed Rail. Uh, from the Bay Area, I'm here with a number of our uh, supporters. Um, I want to thank you for the first time in this uh, business plan, we see a benefit cost analysis. I appreciate the fact that you did that. I used to prepare benefit cost analyses as an engineer for the City of Los Angeles many years ago, and I know uh, the things that can be done with them. I see, interestingly, you see a positive benefit uh, cost ratio of 1.57 to 1.78 for the entire phase one. That analysis reflects the capital, operating, and maintenance costs. What it misses and doesn't include in the costs are the decrease in values of land for homes, businesses, farms throughout the state, the businesses and jobs that are lost because of the money spent on this project or because of the construction impact of the project, and the environmental costs of the construction. Finally, there's no comparison to the benefit cost ratios of the alternative transportations, or transportation alternatives, which are mentioned in the report but not analyzed. I think you need to go back to the drawing board again. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. Let me, uh, Mr. Yes. Hart, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll give you your time back, followed by uh, Ms. Judy Bernal. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm here as a member of the Tea Party Patriots. Our cornerstone of what we look at is fiscal responsibility. And as we've studied this plan, and we have studied it thoroughly, we have a very difficult time trying to accept the re fiscal responsibility that's laid out. On Tuesday, uh, when you introduced your new business plan, you said that this is a preparation of a new day, a new time and a new beginning. Well, I kind of look at it as, do you guys get a mulligan? Do you get to start all over again? Do you get an over? Because the plan that was in place originally, all of a sudden now we have a new beginning. It's as though we just scratched almost everything dollar-wise off of what was there. And so I'm looking at this, and we're looking at it as a a reckoning that needs to be looked at as far as the credibility. The credibility of this board by having all of these numbers coming out, and you're not all responsible, I realize that, but those numbers that came out, and now you've just changed the entire game plan as far as that's concerned. So the question is, we're supposed to accept your credibility of the board and to your numbers, it's very difficult to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bernal, followed by uh, Mr. Dennis Arreyes.
Good morning. My name is Judy Bernal, and I also am here on behalf of the River Valley Tea Party Patriots. My first point is that the original federal funding that was given to Ohio, Wisconsin, and Florida was declined on the basis that they did not choose to further burden their taxpayers with the remaining costs of high-speed rail. Because Florida rejected their funds, that's how we got, we here in California, received the first piece of the funding, but hardly a drop in the bucket. My first point, please do not burden the taxpayers. The second point is, someone already mentioned that the majority of Californians want this project. Again, it's obvious things have changed. My recommendation is take it back to the voters and have another vote with current conditions. Quickly, my next point is I too am in the financial industry. It is my job to, to determine the accountability and risk of each one of my clients. The people themselves are held to a standard of accountability with the bottom line is through their job and dollars, do they have the can they demonstrate their ability to pay the debt? Um, Thank quick, you, ma'am. Um, and quickly, I do have handouts. I have our position paper in opposition. All right. If you, if you hand it to Mr. Reiner, the, um, he'll be happy to distribute it to the board. Thank you. Right. Uh, Mr. Reyes, followed by Mr. Upton. Uh, yes, I'm Dennis Reyes from Los Banos. I'm a Democrat, and I want to let you know I'm also on the school board, and I'm a small businessman there in Los Banos. been on the school board 14 years, some six years ago. Our ADA for our school district was $6,387 per child. Right now, today, we collect less than $4,900 per child. So we're spending less money on education. We're spending tax dollars on a high-speed rail. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I believe that if people in government had a little bit better education, they could balance their uh, checkbooks, and we could all live within a budget and survive. Now, on my farm, what it does is it takes one small dairy of 200 cows completely off the map. It takes my dairy where I milk 300 cows, and my boys are involved in their 20s, and what it does to us is it takes our corrals completely off the map. And because of the rules and guidelines we need to stand by in Merced County, I no longer qualify to have my dairy because then there's too many cows on the number of acres I have left. It also adds 40 cents per ton for my feed that comes off my facility because the rail splits me completely in half. And 5,000 tons of feed comes off a facility less than a quarter mile away from my house right now will be just short of four miles to make the trip, one way. 5,000 tons of feed, 40 cents a mile, that's $6,000 extra on our facility. We won't be able to survive. Next. Uh, Cole Upton, followed by Enrique Mendez Flores. Yes, sir, thank you. I feel I need to apologize. I'm a Republican. Okay. <laughs> But I, but I did hire John Garamendi, Jr. to help me, though, so I hope that you give me some slack on that. Uh, I'm a farmer, and uh, I'm an elected official on two water districts down in Merced and Madera counties. I'm also a, a director on Preserve Our Heritage, and that's a group that's been working cooperatively with a couple of your consultant groups and your uh, regional director. There's about 100 farmers in our organization. I drew the short straw today to come up here. The rest of them are all working in harvest. Uh, what I would urge this board to do is, is, with integrity, to review our draft EIR and EIS comments. Don't just rubber stamp it. Uh, on the, the part that I reviewed, the, counties were, the county was wrong, the roads were wrong, they used the wrong river. The thing was very flawed. It was very difficult to make an intelligent conversation about something that was that flawed. So I'd urge you not just to rubber stamp it. Second, I would urge you to understand the valley. Mr. Katz said that in September the people in the valley are wildly enthusiastic about high-speed rail. We've heard today the people in Fresno love it. North and south of Fresno, they're wild, all right, but I wouldn't call it positive. So I would urge you to work with us because uh, my organization, I think a lot of us, we're working with up and down the state. We're going to spare no expense 
and we're going to foreclose any options to protect ourselves, our families, our farms, and our businesses and our communities from an ill-planned project. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Mendez Flores, followed by uh, Julie Sams. Good morning. Uh, I am here to uh, represent a coalition of community-based uh, organizations. Um, we are established throughout Sacramento, Stockton, uh, Monterey Corridor, and the San Joaquin Valley. As probably Mr. Van Ark knows, uh, many of the materials that we are uh, viewing in the internet or perhaps receiving in the mail are only in English. And if some of us who are interested in the project are digging into, navigating into the internet, we find difficulties, for instance, in the library area uh, where the materials in Spanish are, because actually it does say Spanish, but it says Spanish in English. But this is something that perhaps Mr. Van Ark and his staff and us can work out, right? Maybe? Okay. Um, you don't look too happy today. Um, <laughs> Tim, Tim promised me that that was going to be number one. But Okay, uh, this particular uh, booklet that Mr. Amber showed us, we need to understand it in, in Spanish. So I hope that the commissioners uh, will delegate the staff to provide a lot of these materials in Spanish. Um, we, we, we thank, thank you, sir. And whatever comments you might have, you can go ahead and send them to us in, oh. in writing as well. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Um, and next, uh, Ms. Sams, and then on deck, uh, Mr. Gary Patton and Mr. Bob uh, Snotty. Mr. Chairman, Julie Sams is called away. All right. Thank you. Uh, then Mr. Gary Patton followed by Mr. Bob Snotty. And Mr. Patton, I see that you wish to comment on item number four. And we also have, you, you've actually followed our uh, request, and you've written us a letter, and believe it or not, I know this will be a surprise to some members of the audience, we're literate, and, and we've read your letter. Um, well, I'm glad so, you have, so and go when ahead I and see what you do with it on item four, I'll be delighted, I'm sure. So go ahead and, and use this time to, to comment uh, fully on whatever matters you'd like to comment upon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm uh, very pleased to be speaking to the authority, but I hope I am also speaking through the authority because as you well understand, the authority, the final decision making on this proposed project is not with you, but is with the legislature and the governor. And I hope you and the legislature and the governor will pay attention to these points. First, this plan is heading for failure. It is a fiscal and an environmental disaster. Second, one of the key problems is the route that you are selected to follow was based on political uh, sort of gathering of political forces some time ago, you need to go back and reevaluate it and do it right for high-speed rail purposes if you want to have a high-speed rail project. Third, one of the key problems, and it's really what's driving this, it seems to me, is that you have built and founded this project on a hundred-year infrastructure project on stimulus funds that have to be starting the shovels going by next year. Uh, that isn't the right kind of funding source if you want to take the time to do it right. I hope that you will let the governor know it's time for him to get on the phone personally to President Obama and tell him, look, Mr. President, you and I want to have a big idea. We think it's a great big idea, but we've got to do it right or the whole idea is going to fail here in California and throughout the nation. We need to not drive a stupid project through the middle of functional Central Valley farms as our first step towards the future. Thank you. Um, Mr. Snotty, followed by uh, Mr. Powell, and then Mr. Bill um, Buckman, I believe. Thank you, Chairman Umberg. This is Bob Snotty from Kern Council of Governments. I'll be brief. All we want to really do is just invite the uh, new authority members, uh, Mr. Richard and Mr. Rossi, and the rest of you to an uh, art gallery presentation on passenger rail next week in Bakersfield. We've submitted this invitation to you. And also we wanted to let you know that uh, in our efforts for public outreach, uh, Cal State University Bakersfield 
is going to be offering a winter 10-week uh, course on uh, high-speed rail as an issue. It will be a 6 to 10 uh, class uh, evenings. We are going to invite local members from our stakeholders that are knowledgeable on the subject. Your staff will be also be invited to be guest lecturers. And finally, we have uh, provided each and every one of you a copy of a steering committee group that we have formed in Bakersfield comprised of local uh, public and uh, private organization stakeholders that meet every single Friday to discuss and keep informed about the High-Speed Rail Authority. If you notice, we have the agency, we have the person, and also the email contact. Please feel free to build a personal relationship with stakeholders in Kern uh, County through this uh, source. We can put you in touch with uh, professionals, both public and private. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Snotty. Mr. Powell, uh, followed by Mr. Buckman, and then uh, Mr. Alan Schell. Yeah, my name is Mark Powell, and I own the domain name against California HSR.com. As the name implies, I have not written anything positive about the authority or your project. Today, however, I want to take the time to put the past aside and compliment you on the way you presented your business plan. Your practice of dribbling out selective information to the press and then releasing the entire plan online resulted in banner headlines across the state. High-speed rail could cost $98.5 billion. As you know, this is the low end of a range of cost estimates. A more accurate banner might have said high-speed rail could cost $117.6 billion, as this is the high end of the range of your cost estimates. The difference, $19.1 billion, would make a stack of $100 bills 12 miles high. It's no small accomplishment to hide this potential additional cost from the press and the public even for a few days, albeit at some cost to your trust and credibility with the public and the press when they finally have the time to read the entire plan. Thank you for this opportunity to help set the record straight. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Buckman, Mr. Shell, Mr. David Ortiz. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'd just like to tell you folks how far-reaching this really is. My company is based out of Madison, Wisconsin. We're a biotech company. We're a sister company to Denisco, which is owned by DuPont. And a lot of the research that we're doing here in the Valley might have to go by the wayside if this thing goes through. To shorten the whole thing, there's another dairy down south close to Mr. Arreyes' dairy, but essentially that's going to go right straight through his parlor. And he'll have milk cows on this side, milk cows on that side, nowhere to milk them. So think about that. Uh, this is a very far-reaching thing, and essentially it's not only ag-related. It's all of the biotech jobs that we would have for some of those other companies as well. So think about the far-reaching part of the whole thing. Thank you. Um, next, Mr. Mr. Shell, Mr. Ortiz. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Alan Shell. I'm a retired city manager. Don't let the hat uh, throw you here. Uh, I served uh, six California cities for close to 30 years. I've been retired for some time. I'm familiar with projects uh, only in the millions. Uh, I know very few of those ever came in exactly or under cost. And when you're talking about billions, that's really a frightening thought. Anyway, uh, the fact is that the, the feds are broke, and the state is broke, and all the local governmental jurisdictions are broke. I'll come to the main point that I have, though. I've looked at the, uh, some of the materials, or in fact, quite a bit of them. The one that really disturbs me in the city of Merced, which is one of the important uh, uh, adjuncts to this uh, project, uh, the downtown station, if and when the public ever finds out just what will be eliminated or forced to relocate, it's going to be uh, uh, a, fine, a fun time here to organize. You know, everybody has a protest and a, and a uh, crowd, but uh, you haven't seen that until some of these things come out. Fresno's starting to see that right now. Uh, the point I'd make, though, is that I'm not sure, I haven't seen the total uh, relationship of uh, so-called mitigation, but judging from the Fresno Bee and some other uh, publications, the local jurisdictions, even some of the officials, uh, even in Fresno County, that were all gung-ho on this project, are starting to question 
the problem being what is the local responsibility. Mitigation is a big situation. And we just built an underpass of $13 million. And if we have to do any contributions uh, beyond 100% uh, uh, from the uh, project, it, it ain't going to happen. So my main point is look at that mitigation, whether it's dairies being cut in half or local cities that have to relocate streets and facilities. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Ortiz, uh, followed by Mr. I believe it's Hursting, then uh, Mr. Don Sams. Good morning. I'm David Ortiz. I'm part of the California for Physical Responsibility, which is part of the Merced Tea Party group. Uh, one of my concerns is that uh, discussing high-speed rail uh, with um, what I've learned of the, um, the data comes out that the train will use 1% of the, all the electricity generated by the state of California. And having discussions with some of the engineers from the high-speed rail, they're talking about 4% of all the electricity generated by the state of California. When I asked the engineer where was this going to come from, um, he didn't really have any idea. Uh, there was some speculation that some of the uh, power sources in the, in, the, in the country, like uh, PG&E and, and Southern Edison, are going to somehow develop the sources. However, we're not making any dams. We're not coming up with any sources of generating electricity. The concern is that this uh, increased cost of electricity uh, that, the, uh, that the state will use, the train will use, will be not just 4 percent, but more like 6 to 8 percent. The question is, who's going to pay for it? How much is it going to cost? I have not seen that addressed by the, by the board or anybody on high-speed rail yet. A concern that comes from that as a corollary is that a number of, of residents throughout the state are on a state-controlled um, electrical payment program where they pay a state rate. However, if we're subject to brownouts, blackouts, that's a problem. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hursting, uh, Mr. Sams, then uh, Rosemary uh, Maltbish. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board. My uh, concern is uh, I'm a, 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 a in favor of high-speed rail if done logically. To me, the process is totally out of whack. It should start with upgrading the commuter rail lines with the existing funding. Uh, that picture behind you of, uh, of the downtown intermodal station here in Sacramento, there's a bridge across the river. There's plenty of open space to get high-speed rail lines into San Francisco. Spur wants a new um, under bay tunnel to meet future congestion needs in the Bay Area. The current plan puts, pushes off any of the AB32 uh, benefits from this plan for at least 15 to 20 years. Uh, we should probably electrify the com uh, commuter rail lines and make them as high speed as possible and practical and the blended system. That, that would be my approach. Thank you. Mr. Sams, followed by uh, Ms. Uh, I believe it's Mulbesh. Uh, Don Sams, I'm a Sacramento, Sacramento County uh, resident and voter and retired manufacturing manager, which is uh, essentially a dead industry and this state, as many of you are probably aware. I've read the business plan and the segment that goes down through uh, the Central Valley, chosen in order to step aside public uh, opposition, unfortunately is one of those things that begins to emanate from our national leadership and our California leadership, and that, I find that truly sad. The funding uh, assumptions are killers now and into our future, and my belief, and as a grandfather, that concerns me very significantly. I want to see this thing stopped before it buries us deeper in debt. 
And I have a position paper t to uh, pass on to you via your clerk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Molbesch, followed by uh, Ms. McMahon, followed by uh, Ms. Cynthia Ward. Good morning. Rosemary Molbesch from Atherton. And the revised business plan has not made me a believer in the value of high-speed rail for this state. I am totally opposed to the project. A state that cannot adequately educate its citizens should not be spending money on how to move them around the state by rail. If those people haven't been able to develop skills, life skills, that will enable them to be constructive citizens, the speed of mass transit will not be important. I'd recommend that we repeal 1A and spend any money we can get on educating our citizens. Instead, in regards to rail transportation, we should improve the existing regional rail transportation. Excuse me. Develop an umbrella agency that has the authority to make professional, well-informed rail decisions that ignore the barriers of those many current rail fiefdoms and focus on the overall improvement of existing rail lines up and down the state. Current regional rail transportation is greatly hindered by the competitive rather than cooperative nature of the separate rail systems involved. Get united, improve what we have, forget high-speed rail, and spend money on educating our citizens instead. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. McMahon, uh, followed by Ms. Ward, and uh, Mr. Volz. Good morning. Is it possible to put up the timer again? Uh, sure, go ahead, Thank if that you. works. It's hard to um, know what people are doing. Hi, I'm Mary Helen one, McMahon. One, one second, ma'am. Yes, certainly. If you can continue, and it will go up when it's one minute. When one minute's left, and it will count down. Sorry, it doesn't allow a 90. Okay. So it's kind of Okay, somebody start counting for me then. Okay, I'm Mary Helen McMahon from Burlingame, co-founder of High Speed Boondoggle. I'm here to address you, the governor, and California legislatures. I am really concerned that this plan, which I believe is flawed, has become a jobs bill somehow. And I'm concerned that the estimates of your job uh, increases are grossly inflated on a net basis California has to spend money on transportation. It's either going to be high-speed rail or airports and highways, according to the um, discussions that you have in your business plan. Construction jobs for high-speed rail will include transfer of construction jobs from these other much-needed transportation projects as well. Similarly, when this train, if it is operating, jobs will be transferred from the airline industry to this one. So I would encourage you to relook at your job estimates and present them in a way that people understand what the true net increase, if there is a net increase in jobs, is because of this rail program. Because this program is currently being sold to many people in this country, including in this um, state, including our legislatures, as the answer to our economic and job situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ward, Mr. Volz, and then uh, Mr. Don Barnaby. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Ward. I live in Anaheim with my family, and I flew up here specifically for this meeting today because I think that it's important. I know that um, this particular board doesn't have the authority to pull the plug on this project, and you're going to keep pushing forward for as long as it's being funded. I came up here today hoping that those who do have the ear of Governor Brown or maybe some of our legislators who are holding the purse strings will hear the pleas of this state. I have a lot of neighbors in Anaheim who couldn't get away from work to be able to fly up here. So they asked me to please let you know that this isn't a peninsula thing, this isn't a Central Valley thing. The entire state is standing pretty unified. If you look at um, the surveys that have been done, this is no longer what we voted for. This no longer represents AB 3034. It no longer represents Prop 1A that barely passed. Now we see that the $43 billion project is going to cost us $98 billion. 
I have to tell you, I have four college-aged children, and they're looking at the economic meltdown of this state, and they're not seeing a future for themselves. My kids can't get the classes that they need to graduate from college, and they know that once they do, there probably won't be a job for them, and they're going to have to leave. When our productive future leaves the state, we're in big trouble, and it's not going to matter what kind of a train we have if nobody's here to ride it. So I'm asking you, please, go back to Governor Brown, let him know that this is a mistake and we need to back out of it before any more money is spent. Thank you.